evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Yes, the nerd gin is back. My name is Spivey4994. That's what they call me on IG. And I'm here hosting the Nerd Gin Fall 2020 Hot Topics. And the Nerd Gin creator himself, that's right. He's in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Pablo, say twice Solano. P, how we doing? We doing good, man. We doing real good. And ladies and gentlemen, because you demanded it, because you beat down the doors, and because he's one hell of a guy. That's right. I'm saying it. Commentator extraordinaire. Good friend of ours. Glad to have him back. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Schultz is on the mic. Brian, how are we? I'm great. I don't think I can live up to that kind of an intro, but I'll certainly try. <laughs> appreciate. It. Always appreciate it, guys. Always appreciate it. And we got a lot of news, so this is awesome. We got a lot of news. Your agent called. He said, I want some hype. I said, yes, sir. So I got to stir the pot. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nerd Gen is back. We're going to talk four hot topics, and we're in the midst of a of a outbreak of great and interesting news, unfortunately, in the current times. And um, how's that box office doing, gentlemen? Neither one of you mentioned to me, because we cheat around here, ladies and gentlemen. We talk about things before we even hook up. I'm quite surprised about Tenet, and it's amazing to see that it did very well internationally. P, how you feel about that? It just says that people are, are, you know, are trying to go out and trying to get out to see something, you know, from uh, a director like Christopher Nolan, especially with all the hype surrounding it and the, I guess the, the risk they they're, they're taking in throw, putting it out for people to go see, and people have been responding slowly. I mean, we we surely didn't expect box office records of any kind oh these numbers are crazy yes but I'm like, you know whoa over time you know people are calling it a failure and and i don't see it that way you know uh i think people are doing the best they can there's people out there that want to go see it and it's under a controlled environment so we got to remember that so who knows if this wasn't the case if we weren't going through these time how, how good tenant would do and Brian, I want to fish that question to you, but let me tell you something, Mr. Schultz. I am quite impressed by Milan. I feel we were robbed. This thing would look great on IMAX. I just think that this is just another victim of the current times we live in because Milan looked great. Even before everything happened, the previews were, were outstanding, and I just feel really bad that, that I think we were robbed. How you feel about that, B? Besides Tenet, give me a sp perspective on Milan. I think we were robbed. That thing would have looked great on IMAX. Well, I agree with that. Let, let me tie a couple of these things together, and I'll bring it back to the topics near and dear to our heart, because I think there's at least one movie out there that might fit into this somewhere, and that's Black Widow. So Milan, if we believe the latest report out today by independent research that gets Seven Park data, um, they are claiming that Mulan may have made over $260 million domestic already. And that's really significant because Disney doesn't have to share that with a theater. That's a hundred percent take for Disney through Disney+. Okay. Plus. Mm. okay. If so, that's a big number. We've also seen that movie true, flopped true. internationally. There was a lot of things on the China market that made Mulan sort of disappointing there. But we saw the global box office for Tenet has been outstanding. The US box office for Tenet has been a little shaky. Mm -hmm. It leads me to the very yeah. logical question of if you're Disney for Black Widow, knowing you the Marvel properties have always done well overseas, do you release Black Widow in theaters overseas and then attempt to do it on demand in the U.S. and Disney Plus? What, what if you combine wow. those two and did them at the same time? Right now, that looks to me like the biggest path to profit if you're putting a movie out. So I'm curious yes. to see if Disney will try it that way, where it's available to U.S. customers on demand and it's in the theater internationally. Wow, how you feel about that, Pete? I think we've uh, struck the uh, old uh, gold mine because I, it's just funny that we're in this situation and it's almost like, you know, they throw the baby in the pool and swim, swim, swim. And I think these products, because at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we, around here we always like to educate people in media. They're called products. And from what 
Our good friend B. Schultz just said, I think he's on to something. How you feel about that, P? Hey. Just knowing that I don't have to share this money with anybody, can we grow from here? Is okay. good enough for me to attempt something a little better. And Black okay. Widow, I think, has... Yo, you aren't going to tell me right now. None of you are going to tell me. None of you out there listening to this who has been to the movies three to four times to see one film I haven't been waiting for this. You tell me, Brian, that you won't pay another $30 if you had to to see it a second or possibly a third time if it's that good. That's all. At, of and all that money is yours. Of course. If they think about it that way, they're going to have to release it. And they're slowly just seeing what others are doing. Tenet is the reference to look at, right? And so they're looking at that and weighing what the options are. And I think this possibly may be the last delay that we see from them. And if so, hey, I'm going to see it three to four times, man. You know how many times I've seen The Winter Soldier? Oh, man, come on, man. That don't even count. We're talking about the greatest. We're I've seen Avengers, pro Avengers Endgame like three times. Infinity War, a bunch. If the movie is dope, and I'm telling you, this is something that the fans have been waiting for. And if Disney decides to go a route where they're going to release it, we have to pay them probably a little bit more. I'm sure they're going to get that money that that you know that they don't have to share with nobody the idea of that is good enough for me to want to try something i share this man's enthusiasm yeah i mean also think if you have a family of four and you know i think a lot of people were surprised at the 30 dollar price point but think about it if you took if you had to buy if you had to buy four tickets to the of theater course. how much that would cost you versus Plucking down thirty bucks to watch Brian, it as a family on your on your flag screen. It's a good deal for a lot Brian, of people. Right, forget so, about the four tickets, popcorn, hot dogs, drinks. Of course. You cooking in the kitchen, cooking up some steaks and getting the meal that you want to get, Chick Fil A, wherever you want to get, because the movie theater's food is not that great anyway. Bum ba dum pop. <laughs> it sounds like a win to me. <laughs> it sounds like a win to me. I just like, gentlemen, if you both know, I love business and I like the strategies and the strategium because now, and not to throw up the topic, Wonder Woman 1984 has got to be looking at this. The people at Warner Brothers has got to be gauging. And I guess the first thing, like you said, Pablo, tenant, overseas, success, Mulan, VOD. The way you said it be, success. It looks like the future. People gonna have to put on their thinking caps at those studios. And it's just not business as usual, right? Because right now life isn't business as usual. So you gotta think out of the box. Will you gentlemen agree about that? You gotta innovate. I don't know that it's an option though for Wonder Woman 1984. And here's why, because Disney Plus from a subscriber perspective has been very successful. HBO Max has not. That's why I didn't even mention Wonder Woman. So obviously if they put Wonder Woman 1984 on HBO Max, it would bring people in. There's no question, but I don't think they have enough of an established base to throw a movie that big out there like that. So I'm not sure actually Warner Brothers feels they have the flexibility to do it the way that I'm sort of proposing Marvel handle could handle Black Widow. I think Disney has a little more in the way of options. I think HBO Max is uh, piecemealing and I think HBO Max is just putting it all together. P, you and I both agree. I mean. They're, gonna, they're bringing over this, they're canceling that. You can watch Doom Patrol. It's going to be have a season three, but guess what? It's off the DC Universe, which obviously means, ladies and gentlemen, the DC Universe platform will soon meet its, and I'm not going to say demise, it will soon be absorbed. Is the, hey, you like that one, P? Absorbed into HBO Max. Agree? Disagree? I just think, I mean, if we, you know, I think of something like the Snyder Cut, that's perfect for bringing interest and subscribers to HBO Max. Whatever we think of the product, it is the perfect vehicle to get people to subscribe. 
Wonder Woman 1984 is, is too big of a property to risk in that fashion. I mean, that was what, you know, 800 million of global box the first time out. They're clearly hoping for a billion plus under normal circumstances. I just don't think they take the chance unless they know that yeah. they, you know, the existing subscribers are there to give them a huge domestic box office. Of course. And listen, I, I said that I spoke, I've spoken about this at nauseum and I'm going to keep it short. Obviously, Warner Brothers understood that there was a fan base for Zack Snyder cut. And those are subscriber numbers to them. They don't care about this property. This is this, 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 Do you think they really care that they care about the people who have for four to five years, however long, but it's been a very long four or five years, that they've want, released a Snyder Cut. That's it, it never died. It only got stronger. Yeah, we well, recognized yeah. it and they're taking advantage of it now. That's it. Move on. Four years, 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to hit you with a little bit of MCU news, which I love talking MCU news because it's all nice and structured. First thing out the bat, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, that's only the first time I said, ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, I got to get the engines cranking. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Walters, a.k.a. the She-Hulk, has been casted. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Marvel has been casted. What a time for Disney Plus, because these two ladies will have their own showcase. In other words, they will have their own show. Gentlemen, I think this is all part of the process. I think once again, MCU shows us, Kevin Feige and the team shows us how they built out their universe. It's not like that crazy kid across the street. Everything over here is structured. I'm loving it. I've had a different change of opinion on some of these properties. Right now, I can't call it. P, how you feel about She-Hulk and Miss Marvel in the current status quo? And we spoke about Miss Marvel, and I and I simply said I think Marvel is trying to over the summer uh, 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 gain a different uh, 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 demographic, uh, okay. teenagers, and because they have the young and old adults. Now they're going for that CW type show, but better. So uh, Miss Marvel, I feel, is, is is certainly not necessarily a risk, but a test. To see if they they can continue on with that, because obviously, I mean, who's the top dog here in terms of that demographic? Spider Man, right? Of course. But you got you got to have some others, right? So they're they're going that route now with with She Hulk. This is you and I both agree. We have our doubts about She Hulk. I have my doubts as well. I I believe in Marvel, but I I'm, I, I'm like I don't know type feeling with uh with she hulk because again we don't know what this is gonna this is gonna look like nothing that i imagine in my head looks good um yeah so we'll have to see and and i'm not to drift but to make a comparison it's like you 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 can't make he-man dope you can certainly try People will go out, but to make it He-Man, it, it it's just you don't. How how does this look? That's what I don't know yeah. about She-Hulk. Yeah, yeah. So I can think. I kind of lump. I kind of put these all together, and I would say that coming off of the success of Endgame, the worst thing Marvel could could have done, in my opinion, is play it safe. So I like that we are seeing them venture into different types of characters uh, you know different ethnicities for leads finding leads who are you know not necessarily the biggest name actors or actresses but you know have a little bit of a following or a cult following or they're the number two or three person on, on another show and and giving them a forum as a lead I think that's exactly what we as an audience would hope they would do and the reality is Marvel already knows that the first formula the one they use to tie together the first 22 films that works that is there for them anytime they want to use it and the yeah. audiences will come out so yeah. they need to be looking at how do we push the envelope 
and find new avenues. As Pablo said, new audiences. How do we connect maybe and create different characters or different worlds? So I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to see the representation in the, in the choices they're making. I'm thrilled to see characters that, quite honestly, if we didn't have streaming services, if we didn't have TV the way it is today, I don't know that all these properties would make it to the big screen, but I'm thrilled we get to see them try it in front of us in an actual show. And the reality is, some of these probably won't make it over the long run, and that's okay. I'd, I'd much rather have a Marvel that's not afraid to fail than a Marvel that just wants to sit on the one formula that it used the last time and keep doing that over and over again. Excellent perspective. I think that me and Mr. Pablo Say it Twice Solano said this before. We are both, and now we are all three, gentlemen who review and revere this industry that we call media. And we also designated some shows that we saw, and I think we did it the, I think we did it the right way, Pete. One season, we said it. One season, two season, three season. Why? Because there's other properties that might pop up that's going to fill the space. And Brian, tell me how you feel. I'm sure Disney Plus will be a ratings game. This property is more popular than that property. Gentlemen, we haven't even begun to talk about when we absorb the previous Netflix shows. I said that, P. We said it on a podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, it's there in the air. We said it. Once the Punisher comes back, one of these other shows is gone. Unless they're just going to keep everything. How you feel about that, P? Maybe Disney Plus will keep all of it. Maybe Luke Cage, I, I, maybe everything will stay. Even though we know Punisher is going to be one of the top rated Disney Plus shows. Right up there probably with The Mandalorian. I've said, me personally, if I was sitting with the Disney Plus execs, I'm quite certain they would not agree to put a show like The Punisher on Disney Plus. I think what they would do is put The Punisher on Hulu for that more graphic type violence okay. serious type show. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I, Punisher okay. is just too much for Disney. I, 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 you don't want to mix the two. And Plus, the, once again, he would wipe out your other shows. Your other shows would be gone based on the ratings. And you can't even compete. No, I don't think so because it's going to be two different um, demographics that are going to be... Everybody's into different stuff. And, you know, and I and I think those, those shows will survive. Um, I don't think they compete with each other because they're not aiming at the same people so and obviously we have billions of people in the world so all they need is a few million and, and you're good there's a few million of us different types everywhere so well i think also what we've seen proven now in the marketplace is the kind of comic book adaptation world and the r-rated world are very compatible so whether it's deadpool whether it's joker whether it's the boys or umbrella academy audiences are definitely willing to gravitate to shows and even quite honestly the netflix shows right the original season of daredevil is a great example um r-rated content doesn't doesn't really push away audiences if the show is made well yeah. so disney that's the thing disney has to reconcile they have to grapple with is their own history as sort of this family friendly uh, organization and that's the content they want to lead with they have to figure out a way to channel that type of content um, to the audiences and the fans who will demand it because they're not going I don't think they're going to accept in certain type of properties a really watered down kind of kid, no. kid friendly version of, of the characters so Hell that's sort of a that's a question that's no. out there so I think that's something they have to resolve but I think they know it I think they know that's something they have to reconcile and figure out yeah it has been announced a couple of weeks ago, and once again, it's due to the fortitude and basic success of the enterprise led by Mr. Kevin Feige, that Sony will introduce Spider-Woman into their Spider-Man collaborative, and I use that word on purpose, collaborative projections with Marvel Studios. Here comes Spider-Woman. I know usually we say, here comes Spider-Man. But no, here comes Spider-Woman. And ladies and gentlemen, I think Spider-Woman is a very mature character. 
I know we remember the cartoon from the 1970s. I remember it when I was a little kid. It was, it was cute. It was it was fun. It was almost like Spider Man and his amazing friends. It was on. It was in that same vein. Spider Woman made it work. Yellow, red, but the character of Jessica Drew, they turned it. They turned it into a spy. And not for nothing, B. I think that worked. You made Spider Woman mm -hmm. completely different from Peter Parker, mm -hmm. and I think that worked. You made her a Shield agent. She went on to go become a, a Sword agent. I think her her character's history was actually developed. B, how you feel about Spider Woman? I think it's great. I think it's I think it's all part of the golden age that we live in, where we can see these characters brought to life. And Olivia Wilde did a really nice job with Book Smart. So excited to see what she can do with a with a property like this. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's more it's more about finding a niche. I think with with as we get into these type of properties, the only thing that really comes down to in my mind is does the studio accurately measure you know the audience for for a property like this and budget it to a level where they can make money off it if they put it put together a good product so like this is probably not the kind of movie that's gonna you know make a billion dollars worldwide but it doesn't have to if it's yeah. budgeted and shot well like it can be very effective in the broader universe that they want to create around spider-man and that's that's kind of at this point all we're all we're asking for if we, and if, if the product is good people will find it that's the that's the bottom line so i'm excited i'm excited to see all these new characters kind of being brought to life and um you know making it out of the writer's room onto the screen yeah and, and to go back to uh, um, a comment you made earlier about you know marvel trying new things and, and and expanding uh, on, on the base that they set with the 22 films and knowing what works and, and, and just trying to, you know, make it bigger. This is just a part of that. And, uh, you know, and the fact that they, you know, Kevin is involved is like, what are you going to do? A Marvel character your own way and not even talk to me? Nah, man, you got to talk to me before you do anything. And I think Sony doesn't want to fail anymore. Of course. I, of I course. think they, they found out, drink the Kool-Aid. What? Drink the Kool-Aid, man. But listen, I mean, Kevin's a machine, but not even that. B, they're successful. I mean, this is not, I mean, uh, listen, let's look at Sony over the last eight years. Gentlemen, nothing has worked right with, with Sony. The Men in Black reboot with our great friend, Mr. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, whom we all love to death, and he said he ain't going nowhere. And Chris, nobody ever wants you to leave Thor. Are you kidding me? Who's going to replace Hemsworth as Thor? Oh, Forget about nah. it. But a couple of the projects that Sony put out there didn't work. Like you said, P, ride the ship. Kevin knows what he's doing. You will get intermediate success and be hyped about it. You will pick up intermediate success being connected to Marvel Studios, knowing that you, that Kevin is not going to allow you to damage the property, but you will have success. And Sony needs some success because a couple of Kevin Hart movies, a couple of things did not work out over the last couple of years, if anybody doesn't know. I think uh, Sony changed their... Uh, their studio uh, leadership, and this guy Tom, he, 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 I guess he, like I said, I guess he drank the Kool Aid, and I, I think that's the best thing to do. You, you, these guys know what they're doing. These properties and franchises are hard to manage. So once you let the guys who've been doing it for a while and who pretty much created the matrix to this whole thing, let them continue to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, King the Conqueror is here. When will he arrive? Where will he arrive? I guess we're going to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, I think Kang is one of the greatest characters created by Stan and Jack. Limitless possibilities, limitless storylines. It's just so in-depth. Kang the Conqueror is here. And on a personal note, I... I was a little caught up in a rumor a couple of months ago when they said it was going to be Kelsey Grammer. I thought that was a home run. I thought that was an automatic. But <laughs> apparently, that did not happen. I'm going to leave that alone because I still prefer Kelsey Grammer. I'm sorry. I do. <laughs> love him. Love his voice. Love his tone. Yeah. That's just Kelsey. Forgive me. You know, that's Frazier. But here we are with a new perspective on King the Conqueror. Pete, talk about it. This came out of left field. We yeah. did it. Yep. 
we did not this was somebody watched lovecraft country and said i want this guy this guy is has done one man shows i believe uh and he is impressing a lot of people with his acting he's impressed me on lovecraft uh, on country i i enjoy the show i enjoy his performance and and the girl too i forget her name and she's been in a bunch of stuff but this guy as kang the conqueror yes and he's gonna pop i mean this is for ant-man 3 so it'll be interesting i think in ant-man 3 he will be introduced i hope so in the same manner thanos was introduced the guy behind the scenes until we get to that 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 well the confrontation when the heroes when the heroes confront him because obviously that's what's going to happen yeah so this is one of those moments where i saw it i was like this is where we go oh marvel did that again because <laughs> right you have number one you have a, a you know a really promising actor he's 31 years old so i think you know to our prior discussion fits perfectly right the profile of a guy who can play this kind of part across a number of properties or shows for a number of years if that's what they want to do but then to put him in Ant-Man 3, to me, that was actually the bigger element of the surprise that they listed him as one of the primary villains of Ant-Man 3. So all of a sudden you're you're taking Ant-Man, which was been a nice success story, but clearly one of their smaller properties, and you're elevating the expectations and the profile for Ant-Man 3, in my opinion, if you're gonna make him you're be a real, correct, a real sir. part. You're they just lifted Ant-Man out of the basement. Yes, not many people believed they were going to do at man 3. oh yeah on top of it you know we've since the since the disney fox you know merger and the assets came over now we're cooking a little bit right because now we have sort of the family and the legacy connections into the fantastic four universe with this character that's the other part of this that gets you really sort of excited when you see hey they don't intend for him to be a one film villain they intend for him to be have his fingerprints all over the universe or at least that's the report so if that's the case that gets us one step closer maybe to our first sort of true iteration of Fantastic Four or the Fantastic Four universe. And that's that's also super exciting. So yeah, by far like a big piece of news, but introduced in a way where you just sort of look at it and say, wow, that's that's cleverly done. And I'm really excited to see all the directions they're going with this. And once again, like you said, in a property that we would not have seen coming. But you know what? Those guys, well, once again, Kevin Feige is just a machine, and we love talking about Marvel Studios, but as I mentioned before, let's go talk to that kid across the street. You can tell when you look at his you, know, you, you look at his lawn, and there's a whole bunch of crap out there, and broken glass, and fire, but anyway, wow, here we go again, ladies and gentlemen, the story that keeps on telling itself, Ray Fisher is back at it, and you know what, I... I this man's more popular now than he was in Justice League. I mean, are you kidding me? The Ray Fisher saga continues. And I don't know how people feel about it. There's other people on YouTube, ladies and gentlemen. People are actually, Pablo, taking sides. I think in a situation like this, with former Warner Brothers management, whom Fisher accused of acting inappropriately, they're no longer there. It's almost like, you know, the boss did this, the boss did that. The, that boss is gone, but you still want some type of... And here's the thing, but I, I, gentlemen, I, I need to hear your opinion on this. We want some accountability. We want... What are you going to do? You can't put those people in jail. So what do you... I mean... How, B, and I want... P, I want you to uh, tell me. What do you want to do? Are you trying to... I don't want to use certain words. Lean Warner Brothers into compensating you with more films? I mean, what are you going to do? You didn't like the substitute teacher. That's life. Unless the substitute teacher slaps you, there really isn't nothing you can do. And we haven't yet heard from the substitute teacher in response to the accusations. So I think I'll try to come at this from a couple angles. First off, let me try to, I was trying to put myself in Ray Fisher's shoes a little bit. And I think based upon what we know about the character and the way it was supposed to go within the DC universe, 
he certainly has lost a lot of the part that originally was promised to him, or at least was mapped out in terms of it doesn't seem like we're getting a cyborg standalone film. The original incarnation of the Flash movie, he supposedly was a much bigger part in that, and now it seems like it's reportedly just a cameo. And Brian, and he, 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 he was a great he was a great cyborg. Right, and I think Zack Steiner has been very public about saying that he, Cyborg was meant to be the heart and soul of his vision for Justice League, and we'll get to see that next year. So I do empathize with sort of a, a, an artist, right, who signs on thinking I'm going to be doing this with the character X, Y, and Z, and then I only get to do one-tenth of that or one-twentieth of that because of sort of the turmoil around the director and the turmoil around the studio especially given how you know early it was in his career that his breakthrough yeah. has kind of turned into this. Okay. I think also the part of it that I can't, it's very hard for us to square because we don't know is, you know, if, if Justice League had been a massive success, would this be happening? So I don't really know the answer to that. And then, you know, the reality is Justice League came out in 2017 and we live in a very different climate in 2020. And so the the ability to have a voice and express concerns and a lot of this is tough because with the non-disclosure agreements that are out there, we're getting these kind of cryptic references to what's happened and we don't really get the sides, the actual sides to this in full. Maybe we will at some point, but you know, I think there's definitely more receptivity to the idea of, okay, if, if an artist was wronged in some way, they can actually speak up and maybe affect change in a way they couldn't even three or four years ago. So I'm trying to kind of come at it and say, okay, if I was creating the Ray Fisher perspective, like how, you know, how, how would it look? And I, I do think Momoa doing what he did is significant. I mean, he has a real clout and, and for him to put his name on that and very publicly back him, I think at least at the very least it bears notice at least it, you have to flag that as a moment and say hmm it does lend a little bit of credibility to at least some of what 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 ray has been saying to tracy's point though there has been so much turnover at warner's itself it's not clear where the even if there was accountability where that accountability would actually need to lie for this to sort of resolve itself so i that's totally that's totally unclear to me but Last point is just for me is like, it seems like everyone who was affiliated with the Zack Snyder vision of Justice League has become this sort of family unto itself. Uh, it, they are rallied around Zack. They've rallied around each other. And maybe because of the reception to the film and sort of all the personal tragedy that followed Zack around, they definitely seem like there's a little bit of an, it feels like there's a little bit of an us against the world mentality sometimes with 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 those those performers. And so you know, maybe this is just a sort of a, an extreme extension of that. It's just hard to say, but um look i mean I, all i can say is i hope we get some clarity because i think yeah. it's tough to live in this sort of tweet a day and sort of to yeah. put a little lighter note on this i think in the justice league movie cyborg kind of gets like a new mutation and new power from the mother yeah. box every day and i feel like ray could kind of pair that with each of the tweets that he puts out about accountability above entertainment if he wanted to but um we'll see that tip to your last point it does not seem like we're close to any sort of resolution anytime soon can i say can i ask you trey do you think it went basically? I mean, Brian makes a, um, you know, he 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 doesn't necessarily change my view as to how Ray is going about doing this, but I understand a little bit more because of the way he put it. I see it a bit different. I just don't agree with how Ray is going about it. But do you believe it went down like this that WB? Hire Josh Whedon. Josh Whedon is not in control. He's being asked to do a job. WB is telling him, yo, you got to do it like this. Ray Fisher is like, nah, I don't want to do it like Josh Whedon is like, listen, man, this is the way they want to do it. And, and, and this is the way it's going to be done. Do you think it was sort of that dynamic that Ray felt the way he's feeling or felt back then and the cast as well? Um, that's the sort of pressure Josh Whedon was under to do this film. And WB is the, and, and the people at WB who were at, at, around at that time aren't around. And the closest thing to it is Josh Whedon. Do you agree with that perspective? Oh, I love this part of the game, boys and girls. This is where I pull out the bullet points. Yes. Bullet point number one. Josh Whedon was the substitute teacher. He was the hired gun to come in and finish this project. Bullet point number two. Just like Brian Schultz said, the team loves their team leader. 
The team leader was unavailable. They hate the substitute teacher. Bullet point number three. Those Warner Brother executives wanted to get their bonuses. And that's from an inside source. That's right. I shared something with you boys and girls. They wanted to quote, take the money and run. The old Woody Allen movie, if you ever saw, take the money and run, where he called the bar soap and it turns into suds, ladies and gentlemen. That was classic comedy. You don't get that nowadays. But yes, you're right. Josh Whedon was hired to finish a film that he couldn't possibly put any type of spin on. He was basically, and Mr. Schultz, I'm sure you'll agree with this, he was basically doing an edit job. Let's keep it real. He was doing an edit job. Why? Tim Burton can't make a Alfred Hitchcock film. Alfred Hitchcock can't make a Zack Snyder film. Zack was unavailable. And now that I get out of my monotone voice, P, you're absolutely right. Um, this is a bad situation because I also I acted a c couple of times in a couple of little pieces, you know, in the back backyard like they just do in the Little Rascals. But you had a young actor who didn't have a track record of anything, and this was pretty much promised his jumping off point. Now, I'm not saying that's why all of these things are happening, but as B said, I kind of understand Fisher. I was supposed to be Richard Dreyfuss in Jaws, but it didn't happen. So what do I do? And like we and you talked about, Mr. Solano, he hasn't been offered anything since. Like, nothing. Like... And is it, is it because he was in? Zach you can reach Snyder's Ray right now. Queen? You can reach Ray. Oh wow! Yeah, you can call. You can call him directly. You you don't got to go through the team. What you talking about? But no, we only joking, ladies and gentlemen. We're not taking shots at anybody. But this is um. I mean, this is a, a, a serious situation. And B, I feel like I know. It, maybe it's the New Yorker in me. Maybe it's that homegrown New Yorker in me. It seems like somebody wants a promise of a future and that's all i'm gonna say i don't want anybody putting in the comments trade what you trying to say extortion oops who said that nah i don't think it's, I, 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 I don't know i don't know because where is this going zach is gonna say he, had, he was a substitute teacher and, and guess what ladies and gentlemen zach has a, a pr people and zach has lawyers too so before you make accusations and this whole thing that i'm hearing we want some accountability yes we want some type of what? Punishment? He ain't going to jail. So yeah. where are we? Where are we, gentlemen? He's not going to go to jail. There is no punitive situation here. And B, there is nothing in contract saying if I don't like the second director, I get to have more money. B, that's not in, that's not how Hollywood works. That's not how media works. So where are we going? What do you want? And not for nothing, it came out a little earlier today, as of noting when we take this show, that he wants now a second investigator. Okay, but <laughs> oh wow. This, hey, this, hey, this B, is that's like we see. don't like the yeah. Hey, B, we don't like the officers at this crime scene. Send us new detectives. Okay, uh, B, how, help me out with this, B. Help me with this. What, what, what are you thinking other than what you had just previously said? What does what does he want? Because at the end of the day, that's what you ask. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? God damn it! What do you want? Or you just want people to be accountable. Okay, we'll send Josh a harsh letter and we'll make sure Jeff Johns only writes Green Latin comic books. I mean, I don't, I don't understand because those two gentlemen can turn and put it back on him. How dare you accuse me? And now we get into a slander situation. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is business. We can all agree and we, I think we've all ended on the, on, on the sort of thought that we don't know how this gets resolved and if it gets resolved what is being resolved per se what happens no as you said Trey no one's going to jail I don't know what money you want I don't know if that's I mean is, is you know what's going on we don't know so I mean to be continued to be continued 
Ladies and gentlemen, the kid across the street also maybe had some good news. Quite possibly, it's being reported that Mr. Henry Cavill has re-upped with Warner Brothers for an extended three-picture Superman projects. Now, we're not verifying it. That is the rumor as of this taping of this podcast. B, can you give me a little historic perspective on Henry Cavill, the interpretations from Man of Steel, and how do you feel about him maybe getting, and we use this word in another podcast, a little redemption? I'm in the pro Henry Cavill camp uh, as Superman, and I. Me too, sir. The, Me too, sir. I think part of the reason I feel that way is there's a piece of the character I don't feel like he's ever been allowed to explore. I think he's he's done a great job on the physical part. He certainly you know, he looks commanding as Superman. He looks powerful. All the things where Zack said, what Zack Snyder said when he first made Man of Steel. I think the quote was, you know, I, I like my I like a strong Superman. I think Henry Cavill has shown you he can certainly do that visually. The part that I feel incomplete about is the Clark Kent persona. I don't really feel like he's ever been given a chance to really dig into that side of the character. We see a couple of scenes of him as a reporter in Batman vs. Superman, but it, it always surprised me, dating back, going back to Man of Steel, how few lines he actually seemed to have in the movie. He was almost sort of like better seen than heard, and I can never understand that because I think he's a quality actor, and we've seen that in other roles, whether it's Mission Impossible Fallout or The Witcher or even Man from Uncle. Like he, he has acting chops, and I'm just not sure why he's never really been given a chance to play that because I feel, and I've said this to Pablo in the past, the Christopher Reeve iteration of Superman is the legend it is because of the Clark Kent persona as much as the Superman persona, and so I think I hope. I hope with whatever Henry gets to do in these next couple of films, I hope that he there's a script that really lets him be his version of Clark Kent because I really want to see that. And I don't really yeah. feel like we've seen it on display yet. So I'm pro I'm pro Henry Cavill from that standpoint. I also think, I mean, if we're going to get into a Superman discussion at all, there's a couple of storylines out there that seem pretty topical and pretty interesting. You know, if you want to sort of link them to current or just sort of link them to the world we're living in now with comic book adaptation. So I'll just throw out sort of Superman Exile Superman Kingdom Come, I think there's an elements there that would be really fun and could be done really well on screen um, if they wanted to integrate those elements into a story because Henry's going to be pushing 40 years old by the time they go to production on the next film. So you're true, going to have true, to true. have sort of a Superman in his prime who's been doing the job for a while. Just I think Correct. whatever you do, you're going to have to choose a story that reflects that versus the origin story that you were telling in, in sort of Man of Steel and even through Justice League because Zack Snyder said like it's about a Superman arc and he only becomes the true Superman in in, in Justice League. So that's that's what I'm hoping for. But I'm pro Henry Cavill and I'm excited he's back and I hope he gets another chance to do a, a solo movie. And I have a lot more thoughts on that if we go down that path. But I, I hope it works out. Listen, Henry Cavill certainly has the talent and pulls off the look totally as Superman. And I've had some, I'd say, harsh words. Not harsh, but not, uh, not. I didn't have a lot of praise for his performance as, as Superman. And as time has gone by and, and listening to people and talking to people, I, I'm, I'm convinced that I, I, I just don't think he was directed correctly and the storyline was, was, was improper for... Superman, and am I blaming Zach? A little bit, you know. He gave us BBS, man. That's on him. That's you on wrote him, it, right? You wrote it. You wrote it. That's you. Like if they were to recast Superman right now, it would be a, obviously a horrible mistake. Right now, most people just want Harry Cavill as Superman. So if we're gonna go that route. Do Superman. Do it the right way. Give us that duality. Of, uh, of 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 Clark Kent and Superman, and let him be because I'm pretty sure Henry Cavill didn't want didn't, wasn't too fond of what he did with the the character, and so he wants that second shot, you know, and and, and I think he deserves it because he he wants to do it, you know, and he can do it, uh, you know, as you can see with The Witcher and, and Mission Impossible, he's done okay, he's doing pretty well, he's hot right now. 
So why not give him that opportunity to do what he, you know, what he wants to do with this character? I think you have to, that's a point I really want to underline because I go back to something Mark Hamill said when Last Jedi came out and he said, I read the script and I went to Ryan Johnson and I said, I pretty much disagree with every decision you've made with regard to the Luke Skywalker character. And wow. then he said, but it, but it's my responsibility to put your vision for the character on screen. And I think we should all remember that anytime we're looking at a character and in an interpretation, like the director sets the vision in theory. Studios always get involved, but director sets the vision. The actor or actress typically has a view and an interpretation as a meeting of a mind, but the final cut and the final say is usually the director. And so if Henry was given the marching orders to play Superman that way to the best of his ability, that's his job. Yes, yes, yes. So you do have to allow, right. So you have to allow for, and I think if you want to see a litmus test of this, let's watch what happens in new Suicide Squad because you have some of the same actors back yes. from the David Ayer version who are now going to be playing James Gunn's interpretation of the same characters. So I'm fascinated to see how different those same characters look when a new director is asking them to play it a little differently. And I think that, you know Henry Cavill fits that because he has range as an actor. So we just want to see a new interpretation, a new vision for it. Let's see how it looks. And not for nothing, the James Gunn Suicide Squad, as I said before, I guess I'm in because I never, ever thought I would see what I saw. That's, that's all I'm going to say. He completely surprised me, the tone, the everything. I was, I was completely shocked. I didn't know what I was. Listen, it, it doesn't look like Guardians of the Galaxy. I was completely shocked. And he looks like he did a better Harley Quinn interpretation than the previous ones. I, I, listen, I'm all in on James Gunn. Suicide Squad, you couldn't have told me that. And now I look at some of the actors he got. Uh, this kid from um, SNL. And he's really going for a dynamic. It's almost as if it's a um, Quentin Tarantino style type movie. And I'm actually interested in what this man has done with Suicide Squad. But, gentlemen, great show. I love the uh, interjection. And I also love your perspectives. I think anyone listening to this podcast, especially you, you YouTubers, will, are going to love the perspective that we gave because it's not only fan-based, but it's also media-based, and it's also a perspective base. Um I'm looking forward to Henry Cavill returning as Superman because I always felt he wasn't allowed to grow. I like the way you guys interpreted it, that uh, Pablo makes sure to emphasize the fact that, you know, he he was a soldier. And Brian, I also like the way you emphasize the fact that the marching orders, rain falls down, and he had to do what he had to do. I'm just glad that he has a, a second chance. I called him early in this podcast, Redemption. Um, this is great. These are the hot topics. Uh, B, Mr. Schultz, anything else to say? Any other thing out there that's uh, tweaked your interest? No, I think the only other thing that's exciting is we're seeing production resume on some of these shows. And I noticed, I think Disney updated its calendar of release dates and they still have WandaVision on as a 2020 release. So, um, oh, yeah. stay tuned. Yeah, that but came out. I'd be very excited to hopefully see some of these, you know, first iteration streaming series with a really big budget finally coming to, uh, coming to our screen. So really exciting time. Mr. Solano, the nerd gen, any comments, sir? Yeah, I'm looking forward to WandaVision. I was very excited when I saw the headline that uh, WandaVision was still on the calendar for 2020. And I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm, it's going to give me that same feeling when I saw The Mandalorian waiting for that show to come on. And it's, it's going to be exciting to see what the next... Because remember, Kevin Feige said, in order to know what, what happens in these movies, you got to watch the shows. So I like that he said that so long ago and it still applies today. You gotta see the show if you want to know what happens next or what this is going to look like. And this is our first peak because I don't think we're going to probably get back Widow this year because uh, they, they announced it for 2021, right? It's officially uh, still November, I think. For, yeah. for Black Widow? 
Yep, November still. Okay. Um, do are we getting one division before or after that? Isn't isn't it wasn't it December? After. Or? After. One division no, was after. listed as a TB, TBD. There's no date around that. It just was listed as 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, I also uh, want to talk about a little project that's not getting a lot of play. Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every little piece and every little information that drip drips out, this series is really, really top notch. Top notch. I, I, I won't get into. Uh, Specifics because that'll be up for another show. So, this is Spivey4994, also for AKS Entertainment. I'm signing out. You guys do the right thing. Take care of yourselves. Take care of, of everyone around you. And I'm, like I said before, my money's on us. I think we're going to get through it. Uh, Mr. Schultz, anything to say? No, just thanks for having me back. It's always fun. Appreciate it. It's an honor. Listen, you know what you're talking about. And I like what you're saying. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Mr. Salado. I, I need to say that that last show that we did, The Black Panther, was a really great show. One of our oh, yes. best viewed yes, shows. Ladies and gentlemen, and, you're right. Uh, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback on it. We, uh, that one was a home run. And it's nice to say that in these times of days because you, you guys know I, I love saying that's a home run. That one was a home run. We like the feedback. And gentlemen, no one disagree. Oh, well, I take that back. Guess what? My good friend, I'm going to give him a shout out. Tim Tanko put in a comment con contrary to what we suggested. But then I called him up, yelled at him. He <laughs> changed his mind. Anyway, this is Bobby 4994 signing off for the Nerd Gen Fall 2020 Hot Topics. We'll see you soon. We'll be back pretty soon because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, new format that we're doing is working, and people are loving it. So until then, go to the movies or what? Keep on streaming. And Umbrella Academy number five. You my man, boy. I'm taking that kid everywhere. <laughs> number five is the joint. Yeah, if yeah. you don't know, then you don't know. <laughs> Good night, everybody. We have fun. See you soon.